love for several of us in the um, Society of Professional Journalists because Ed Maloney represents a lot of things that journalists stand for in this country as well as in the UK. Um, I'm sure you know a great deal about him, most of you. He was the Irish Journalist of the Year in 1999. He's the author of Paisley, From Demodog to Democrat, The Secret History of the IRA, and Voices from the Brain. And he's going to talk tonight about the troubles and about the Boston College Archives, which created their own sort of small team yes, yes. And um, the uh, Society um, welcomes you, welcomes Ed Maloney, and uh, I'd like to tell any of you who might be interested, we are having our annual forum on how we got that story on Sunday, November 16th. I'm not going to take up any more time with that, but if you want to go on the njspj.org website, um, some of you might be very interested in that. That's going to be up in Montclair. So thank you very much. Yeah, take it away. I, first of all, can I, can I thank uh, the Society of Professional Journalists, um, the Guarini Institute, uh, for, for uh, inviting me to uh, uh, this wonderful college, this splendid view of Manhattan, um, to give this talk, and uh, also to thank Francis Burns, who organized this and invited me to, to, uh, to St. Peter's. Unfortunately, Francis is ill tonight, and I'm sure you will join me in wishing her a speedy recovery. I'm going to assume on your part a certain basic knowledge of recent Irish history, and in particular the troubles in Northern Ireland. But it is a very complex uh, topic, a very uh, difficult subject for some people to understand. If you do have questions, um, could you keep them or keep them uh, until, until I'm finished the talk and, and we can deal with them in a, a Q&A session? But I'll try and keep it as, as simple as possible. Um, well. First of all, Ireland is uh, arguably Britain's uh, oldest colony, um, and Northern Ireland uh, is probably regarded as maybe one of the last outposts of that colonial history that Britain had. And the story that I was involved with, and the story that I had to report and cover as a journalist, was uh, a story of a popular insurgency, a low-level insurgency, nothing like what has been happening in Afghanistan, nothing like what is happening in Syria at the moment. But nonetheless, uh, a very long and stubborn conflict that lasted the best part of three decades. And some would say it's still really not over, although the guns never have fallen silent. Uh, my job as a journalist took me to a, a number of uh, uh, newspapers and magazines. Um, I started out in a magazine called McGill Magazine in Dublin in the, in the 1970s. Graduated to a weekly magazine called Hibernia. Uh, joined the Irish Times, which is, I suppose, the Irish equivalent of something like the New York Times or the Washington Post, or at least the people in the Irish Times like to think, think of themselves in that way. Um, myself and the Irish Times eventually fell out, as was, I think, inevitable. And I joined a newspaper called the Sunday Tribune, uh, and was its northern editor for 10, 15 years or so, under the editorship of one of Ireland's greatest journalists, Vincent Brown, who was the man who actually brought me into journalism in the first place, into the editor of McGill. Uh, a very uh, talented journalist himself, and uh, uh, was a man who uh, did not care too much for the conformities and conventions of, uh, of Irish journalism, particularly during the troubles. Um, what, during my years as a, as a journalist in Ireland, and I must also add that I left Ireland in 2001, partly for family reasons, but also because I had just finished a, a major book about the, the uh, IRA and its journey into the peace process, um, a book which would make continuing to cover the story in Northern Ireland, let's say, quite difficult. Uh, but also, it was for me the culmination of my career. It was really time to, to move on. Unfortunately, the story followed me over. I was asked to write more and more books, and I did so. And uh, uh, recently, we have uh, been uh, involved in this Boston College uh, archives affair, which I will talk about uh, later on. But during my 
uh, career, I had certain specialities. Um, they were primarily the paramilitary groups that were active in Northern Ireland, especially the IRA, but also those on the loyalist, Protestant, or unionist side, those who wanted Northern Ireland to remain within the United Kingdom. Uh, the largest of those was a group called the Ulster Defence Association, which was responsible for killing several hundred people during the troubles. And I was also interested in uh, the, the whole issue of Protestant extremism, unionist extremism, loyalist extremism. These terms are interchangeable. Uh, and in particular, the, the, uh, uh, the career and life story of the Reverend Ian Paisley. And I wrote three books based upon these interests. One was a biography of, of Ian Paisley uh, called uh, Ian Paisley from Democrat uh, from de uh, demagogue to Democrat with a question mark at the end because I don't, never really believed that he did become a Democrat, that he was really always a demagogue. Um, the other was, uh, as I just mentioned, the secret history of the IRA about the IRA's internal journey towards the peace process and all the convolutions and conspiracies that uh, made that possible. And finally, Voices from the Grave, which was based upon two interviews from the Boston College Archive. One given by Brendan Hughes, uh, an IRA commander in Belfast and one time best friend of Jerry Adams. And the other, uh, an interview given by David Irvine, a commander in the other major loyalist paramilitary group in Northern Ireland called the Ulster Volunteer Force or UBF. But these were not my only interests. Because the years in which I established a foothold in journalism in Ireland, that is from the mid 1970s onwards, also saw the mainstream Irish media transformed almost beyond recognition, made into a, a virtual tool of government counterinsurgency and rendered into a tame, almost inert witness to the turbulence engulfing Ireland at this time. It is a subject I've written about repeatedly and I've contributed chapters to several books dealing with the Irish media during the Troubles, trying to describe and explain how the violence had twisted and warped the way journalists did their work. Two things happened to the Irish media in the early to mid 1970s. One was the introduction of official state censorship in the, in the Irish Republic, in the 26 counties or the southern part of the divided island. The reason for that uh, had largely to do with an event known as Bloody Sunday, which was uh, the slaughter of uh, 14, mostly, uh, well, they were unarmed and all of them were civilians, bar possibly one by British troops during a march, a civil rights march, protesting at the use of internment without trial, uh, uh, which had been introduced uh, in 1971. The march took place in January 1972. Troops opened fire on the crowd. Uh, 13 fell dead. Uh, a 14th died later in hospital. As a result of that uh, catas catastrophe, uh, there was an outburst of uh, anti-British feeling in Ireland which had not been seen since the 1920s. Uh, workplaces closed down, uh, workforces marched into the centre of Dublin to protest. Uh, there were huge rallies in uh, suburban towns. Uh, the British Embassy in the centre of Dublin was burned to the ground. People were extraordinarily angry. And the government was deeply alarmed because this type of uh, emotion was uncontrollable. Uh, it could lead to a surge in support for the IRA. Uh, and if the IRA got enough support in the southern state, then the, the very institutions of the southern state uh, could be threatened by the IRA itself. Uh, and so uh, the Irish government reacted in, in a, I suppose, a predictable way. Uh, they cracked down on the IRA and they cracked down on all manifestations of, of re revolt and rebellion against uh, the situation in Northern Ireland. New anti-terrorism laws were passed. For example, you could be convicted of IRA membership solely on the word of a policeman, a senior policeman. Um, uh, the police force was strengthened, recruitment was stepped up. Um, and in, in order to influence uh, public opinion, to accept this, uh, this new attitude, this new atmosphere, and to persuade people that the British were really not the problem, but that the IRA was the problem, the government of the day introduced official censorship affecting radio and television broadcasts, known as Section 31 of the Broadcasting Act. And under that uh, new regulation, 
uh, radio stations and television stations were forbidden from broadcasting the words spoken by members of certain named groups. Not just the IRA, which was of course an illegal organization, but also legal political parties of which the government disapproved. The major one of which was, of course, Sinn Féin, which was the IRA's political wing. And in those days, the government's hold over the electronic media was considerable. The main radio and television stage station, RTE, otherwise known as Radio Televisión, was owned by the state, rather like the BBC in Britain, was owned by the state. And the government appointed its governing board, so they had control over the RTE. And to emphasize its new facility to the IRA, and to send a message to other journalists, uh, in Ireland. Uh, an RTE journalist was jailed when he broadcast an interview with the uh, then IRA chief of staff. Now, in those days, of course, we're talking about the early 1970s. Uh, independent radio stations were virtually unknown. Independent television stations were unknown. The mainstream media consisted of RTE, uh, which had radio and television side to it, the Irish Times, the Irish Independent, and the Irish Press, and then you had provincial newspapers. So you had a very, very small media um, uh, you didn't have the diversity that you had now, nor the potential for uh, uh, protest or rebellion against that type of, uh, of move by the government. Two things then happened in the Irish media. Timidity and fear spread faster than Ebola. News <laughs> executives began interpreting the new censorship rules in the broadest possible way, so that, for instance, callers to a radio program about gardening would be taken off air if it was discovered they were members of Sinn Féin, which was a perfectly legal organization. And fewer and fewer programs dealing with the troubles were made. The second trend was even more insidious. This timidity and fear spread into the print media, and took the form of self-censorship, and so began the age of the sneaking regarder, or the fellow traveler, the journalist who insisted on covering the paramilitaries, especially the IRA, Missed the accusation of sympathizing with it. Incidentally, covering the loyalist groups, whose violence was much more primeval and brutal, did not carry the same cost, since in this new dispensation, they were seen as reactive to, and a consequence of IRA violence, and thus less blameworthy. Even though historical facts showed clearly the IRA to have been the result of unionist or loyalist intransigence and mob violence, uh, for example, during the attempted pogroms in West Belfast in August 1969, which led directly to a split in the IRA, out of which came the Provost. So knowing their careers could be destroyed if they were accused of aiding and comforting terrorism, many journalists just stopped covering the issue altogether. One major consequence, really given as much emphasis as it deserved, was that all this stimulated mediocrity in the executive ranks of the media. Managers who were cautious, Editors who were cautious, who erred on the safe side when it came to deciding what and how to cover stories, were promoted. Those who bit more on the edge were not. Mainstream journalism in Ireland went into a decline from which I would argue it has never recovered. In fact, the peace process, I would argue, has, if anything, stimulated a new area, era of self censorship, every bit as damaging. So here you had a society being torn apart by political violence. And the media self-regulated itself against examining the reasons why or the motives of those involved in the violence. Increasingly, coverage became the journalism of condemnation, not explanation, or the reportage of violent events. Last night, a bomb exploded here, a soldier was shot there, but rarely an explanation as to why. And there was no doubt in my mind that this approach helps to explain why the Irish troubles lasted so long some three decades, in a place whose population is smaller than the Bronx. An ill-informed Ill public, an ill-informed body of decision makers, and an ill-informed self-censoring media will always combine to produce bad decisions, which invariably worsen already bad situations. And that's what I think happened in Northern Ireland. I do want to make clear, though, that these comments uh, primarily apply to the Irish media rather than the British media. Some of you may not welcome what I'm about to say, but uh, it is, I think, the truth. And it's not that I absolved the British media of all fault in their coverage of the troubles, but it was so much better, especially in those pre-Thatcherite days of current affairs television, than anything in Ireland. 
For example, the Guildford Four or the Birmingham Six, miscarriages of justice uh, that were awful to those who were the victims. Shoot to kill by the, the peace force in Northern Ireland. Uh, episodes when people were just gunned down by the peace with no uh, accountability, accountability afterwards. All these were boycotted by the Irish media. But most of them were covered properly by the British media, particularly television. Uh, I would exclude a lot of the print media, but certainly uh, in the, uh, what I would regard as the golden age of pre thatcherite British television, the coverage of these uh, types of uh, incidents ignored by the Irish was quite And when Thatcher eventually did introduce electronic censorship in the late 1980s, British journalists did something that had never occurred to their Irish colleagues. They fought back. They went to the Europe. They went to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, they were members of the same union as Irish journalists, but discovered to their horror that there had never been any resistance on the part of Irish journalists or the Irish branch of the same union to the censorship laws that existed in Ireland. And to illustrate just how bad it was, uh, when the National Union of Journalists announced that they were going to take the factory broadcasting ban to Europe and challenge it, the father of the chapel, that is the shop steward, of the NUJ chapel in RTE resigned in protest. Can you imagine a journalist resigning in protest from his union because that union was going to challenge censorship laws? That's how bad self-censorship was in Ireland. And in Ireland, uh, in order to take a case to Europe, it had to be taken in the case of an individual journalist. You can go there as a body, you have to say, I, as a journalist, have had my rights uh, breached by this act. And the union canvassed uh, for volunteers. They could find no one in Dublin, no one in the main cities of Ireland to volunteer to put their name uh, to, to the application to Europe. And they had to go to an obscure uh, radio station in an Irish-speaking part of, West, of the west of Ireland in order to find a volunteer. That's how bad it was. Nor do I want to paint with too broad a brush. While the majority of journalists did succumb to these pressures, there were many who did not, who continued to strive to tell the truth as they saw it and to dig where others were, would not. They were mostly at the edges of the Irish media, in small magazines and publications. I've mentioned one already. Vincent Brown, who gave me my first break in journalism. It's important to understand that I'm really talking here about the equivalent, the Irish the New York Times, the Washington Post, PBS, CBS, NBC, etc. Uh, and in those days, as I say, RT had a virtual monopoly of electronic media. And I want to give you one example of what I mean when I say media self-censorship contributed to the troubles and it may actually have made them worse. Uh, in 1982, in the wake of the hunger strikes, uh, in, during which 10 IRA prisoners uh, had died uh, seeking uh, political status, uh, Sinn Féin decided uh, to stand in an election for a local assembly. Um, it was obvious to me, covering the story as I was covering it, that Sinn Féin were going to do particularly well. The emotions were high, um, uh, sentiment against the British was enormous, um, and uh, you know, you, you really have to be living in clan cuckoo land uh, not to believe or not to realize that these people were actually going to do very well at the polls. And I predicted in the Irish Times, which I was their northern editor, that in this small assembly of some 80 members, uh, Sinn Féin would uh, certainly get three seats, would probably get five, and possibly might get seven. Uh, and the result came out, and they had actually won five, and they nearly won seven. So I got the story right. But I was the only one to say that. Every other journalist covering the story had said that no one in their right mind would vote for these people. They were men of violence. Uh, they would reject them. And this was at a time when the conventional wisdom about the support for the IRA was that less than 1-2% of the population supported them in traffic areas, but not much more than that. And of course, that was nonsense. I mean, if you just examined uh, the realities on the ground, here was uh, a, 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 an insurgency that had lasted at that stage uh, for the best part of 10, 10 years or so. Um, uh, it, it had uh, continued despite the presence of thousands 
at some at one point tens of thousands of British troops, uh, a massive police force, a massive intelligence gathering operation, and the fact that the IRA had survived so long had to be due to the fact that they had popular support. It was clear that in order to run a campaign of violence at that level against a force as large and as formidable as the British, you had to have uh, uh, people who would open their doors to you, who would give you shelter, who would give you money, um, who would hide your weapons, who would supply weapons, who would supply intelligence, all these basic necessities to fight uh, uh, an insurgency like this uh, were quite formidable. And to sustain a war as the IRA had for that length of period, common sense suggested, in fact, it dictated that there, there had to be a, 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 a considerable amount of support, well above the one or two percent that was the, uh, the, the conventional view at that time. So I made that prediction, um, saying that uh, Sinn Féin were actually going to do quite well, and, and they did. Um, and then later I discovered that if I had got it wrong, the Irish Times had plans uh, to move me out of the office. In fact, I was told the very next morning if I had got it wrong. And my response to that was, well, yeah, if, I, if I got it wrong and I was going to be punished for getting it wrong, what about all the guys who did get it wrong? <laughs> and of course, the answer was that they got it wrong for the right reasons. <laughs> I got it wrong for what was perceived to be the wrong reasons. But that, you know, the consequences for me uh, 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 of this episode were very secondary compared to what the episode said about Irish society's understanding of the real meaning of the result. The Irish government and the mainstream media saw it in very simple terms as an alarming endorsement of violence by a section of nationalists, and they acted accordingly, urging the British, for instance, to ban all official contact with Sinn Féin's elected representatives to isolate them and thereby, they hoped or thought, undermine it. Had they more properly understood the complexities of that work, had the Irish media uh, done or been able to do its job properly, they would have done the opposite, encouraged government interaction with Sinn Féin, encouraged the provost to seek political rather than violent remedies. And that election really was the beginning of the peace process. It had set and forced motions that would eventually force the provost to choose between violence and electoral politics. Uh, but neither the media or the government could see that, and self-censorship and censorship were the reasons for that. Attempting, therefore, to isolate Sinn Féin by denying access to British officials that served only to delay the peace process, probably by several years and costing lives that otherwise would not have been lost. The mainstream media made this possible. The fear of being labeled terrorist sympathizer at worst, or being labeled soft on terrorism at best, ensured that in Ireland the media was, by and large, intimidated into compliance with counter-insurgency goals. That meant that most journalists, most news outlets in Ireland closed down their coverage of the principal competent in this fight, and as a result, missed the story. And because they missed the story, there was no one around to tell the government they had got it wrong. Those who did try to tell the story were dismissed as IRA fellow travelers, sympathizers, and so on. I think it would be remiss of me not to draw some parallels at this point with the experience of the US media in recent years, especially since 